Okay, I think we can get started um, and people can continue to join as we go. So first of all, by way of a quick um, introduction, I am Rain Sherlock, I'm the evaluation manager here at Tezo. Um, so working on a bunch of evaluation projects, one of which is trying to help the sector to capacity build and understand different methodologies. So today we're gonna to be talking about quasi-experimental designs and I'm going to be co-presenting with my colleague, Zara. Hi. So I'm Zara, and I'm a research officer at DESO, working on mostly on evaluation. Thank you, Zara. So a quick outline of our session today. Um, I will give you a quick overview of TESO generally, for those of you who might be new or haven't worked with us or heard of us before. Um, and then we're going to get straight into the, the kind of methodological content. So we'll give you an overview of quasi-experimental designs and a brief introduction. We're then going to talk through three of the kind of main tools in our, in our QED suite. So the first is propensity score matching or PSM. The second is difference in difference, or we sometimes call that diff in diff. Um, and thirdly, we'll talk through regression discontinuity design, so RDDs. Just to flag up front that we have um, kind of marked this webinar as intermediate to advanced. So it does come with the assumption that you have some idea of experimental designs and some knowledge of different evaluation methodologies already. Um, there's quite a lot to get through today and it may seem a little technical at points. We've tried to kind of simplify it as much as possible. Um, if you do find yourself feeling confused or unsure of what what the content is trying to convey at any point, do use the, the, the Q&A and we'll come to that at the end, but also feel free to email us afterwards and we'd be very happy to explain further and also provide further kind of reading and materials for anyone who feels a little lost. Um, but hopefully it's, it's simple and straightforward and easy enough to understand. So a quick intro to Tezo or a reminder for those of you who may already be familiar. Um, as you can see on screen here, so we are an independent hub for educational professionals, and we're really here to support the sector to provide research and toolkits and evaluation guidance like the session today. Um, we were set up by a consortium of colleges, so King's College London, Nottingham Trent, and also the Behavioural Insights team. And we spun out to become an independent charity actually almost exactly a year ago, it will be a year next month. So we're now an independent charity um, working to reduce inequality gaps in higher education. We're also an affiliate What Work Centre. So some of you may be familiar, there's about nine of these centres across government um, working in, in different kind of domains. Obviously, we're within higher education and our, our mission is to kind of produce high quality evaluation evidence on what works to help inform policy and practice. And then finally, at the bottom here, it's worth noting that we are we're funded by the Office for Students. So for those of you with us today who are within the higher education space, um, you will know about the OFS, who are the regulator, um, and we are the kind of evaluation function that they fund to produce better quality evidence. So I just wanted to start by situating our session today in the kind of TESO evaluation cycle. So what we think of kind of evaluation as reiterative, which is something that should be kind of demonstrated by the circular nature of this diagram. And the process, the idea is that the process kind of supports continuous improvement. So each of the phases should kind of lead into and help bolster and develop the next phase. Um, Today we are situated within the plan phase, so this is where we would sort of identify our research questions and identify the methodologies that we want to use. And what we're going to be discussing is um, quasi-experimental designs as one methodology that sits within that plan phase. Um, if you've joined previous TESO webinars, you will, you will know that we have a kind of webinar for each of these phases. Um, and it might be helpful to go back and watch those so that you understand at a sort of high level what we expect to happen within each phase. So um, when designing this, I was kind of talk making notes and making slides about QEDs. And I thought it's important to just take a step back and quickly revisit the idea of causal inference and counterfactuals. So we're going to spend just a couple of moments here. <clears throat> 
Um, so what we really want to know, at least at TESO, and I think a mission probably shared by many people um, joining the webinar today, is what are the most effective ways of helping underrepresented or disadvantaged students to access higher education? And how can we support them to succeed once they're within higher education? So as you will know, if you have kind of followed TESO's journey so far, um, we've produced a number of reports over the last couple of years specifically evidence reviews that all come to a similar conclusion which is that there's a real lack of robust causal evidence on what works to increase access to higher education for disadvantaged and underrepresented students but also to help disadvantaged and underrepresented students succeed once they're in higher education and so we talk about this kind of lack of lack of causal evidence or a lack of causality um, and one thing that I wanted to sort of caveat, I guess, or a disclaimer up front is that all of these terms, so causality, causal attribution, causal evidence and causal inference, are getting at the same idea. Um, they're kind of different terms for the same thing. And what we're really trying to understand is what, what is the kind of cause and effect? So does activity A cause outcome B? Uh, that might look something like, does a tutoring program cause an increase in attainment for disadvantaged students? Of course, this, this diagram makes it look really straightforward. We have A and we have B and we have a nice straight arrow between them. Um, it's important to say that it's not that straightforward. There are a number of factors that make estimating causal inference or estimating cause and effect really quite difficult. Um, it's very complex. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go over the kind of intricacies of causality and correlation versus causation in this session today, but we do have a, a webinar on that um, on our website and I actually I think I did flag it as a kind of precursor to this session. So if you haven't seen that and you do want to understand the theory behind causal attribution and causality, I would encourage you to go back and watch that as well after this session. Um, what we'll do today is explore some of the ways in which QEDs, quasi-experimental designs, can help us understand causality and causal inference. So um, the other question that we're interested to, to address at the kind of meta level is why care about causality? Why is this important? And I think it's worth flagging that while you can have a good evaluation without exploring causality, so your evaluation may not include causal questions, it might be an, a kind of process evaluation rather than an impact evaluation. I would argue that if you're trying to look at impact, you really need to consider causality um, and you need to include that in your evaluation. So that's really what impact evaluation is trying to do. I also think the fact that many of us, if not all of us um, on this call or on this webinar today are trying to impact equality gaps or trying to impact outcomes for disadvantaged and underrepresented learners, that means that we should at least explore causality. So the different methodologies that can help us unpack the causal link between the activities that we do and the outcomes that we're trying to affect. We also align with the OFS standards of evidence, which you can see here on screen. Um, and to tie it back to that, for those, those of you who also align to the OFS standards of evidence, I wanted to just demonstrate where I think we are currently. So you can see at the top here, I think we've got good type one evidence. Um, many people now use theories of change. We have good narrative evidence describing what we expect to change and the kind of mechanisms or assumptions that underline that change. I also think we have some type two evidence, so emerging empirical evidence, getting better at collecting data and estimating correlations. I think I see that more and more in the literature and coming through from the sector. Um, so this helps us understand whether participation in activities is related to changes and outcomes. But as I've mentioned, we're really missing this third standard of evidence, so the kind of causal evidence. And this, this is the missing piece of the puzzle. And this is one of the, the QEDs are one of the things that can help us hopefully kind of fill this gap or start to plug the gap. So on to QEDs, how can they help us bolster this kind of type three evidence um, or the, yeah, the causal evidence? So what we want to do is 
generate causal evidence, but whilst also recognizing that it's difficult to establish causality when we're dealing with kind of real life contexts. So often in the literature, we're, um, we're seeing this in kind of nicely designed lab experiments that then may get taken out to the field. But what within the kind of WP or the access or student success space, it's often really hard in real life context. We're working with higher education providers, colleges, schools, and also in a super busy intervention space. So there's a lot of activity happening across a lot of different levels, and it can be really difficult to isolate this idea of cause and effect. I think randomization is often the principle that people think about when they think of causal, causal evidence. Um, and I guess what I want to highlight is that QEDs are just one alternative or one other methodology that we can, we can use. Um, and they come in to provide a slightly different take on causality. So a quasi experiment is an empirical study used to estimate the causal impact of the intervention on our target population, but without random assignment. And I guess the key difference here is that in all of the control and comparator groups that we're about to describe and, and kind of think about together, we're not using randomization, which I think is the, the thing that people think about when they think of causal evidence. So um, the control group in a QED or in, a, or in a study using randomization, I guess, allows us to observe a counterfactual. I want to just pause here and make sure that we really understand uh, what we mean by a counterfactual. So in the most simple form, when I say counterfactual, what I mean is what happens when the conditions of our intervention that we're interested in trialing are not present. So when trying to think of an example, um, I guess I came up with the idea that I would be curious to know how my day varies, in particular, my kind of productivity at work varies if I were to introduce or take away different factors. So a kind of coffee in the morning versus no coffee in the morning. If I were to go for a run in the morning versus not exercising in the morning, and then maybe like an extra hour sleep versus a, a shorter night's sleep. One example of a counterfactual here could be if I slept for an extra hour and I didn't go for a run in the morning, would my coffee make me feel more awake or make me feel like I have more energy? So it's really just trying to understand the, the alternative reality, I guess. Uh, a slightly nerdier and also maybe more gruesome example that we could think of when trying to design these slides was the um, first Spider-Man movie. So some of you may remember the, the first movie a long time ago, and there was a point at which Peter Parker had the opportunity to stop a thief, um, but he chose not to. And when asked why he chose not to, his kind of explanation was that it's not his job to stop crime. Later in the movie, we see a scene where his kind of beloved uncle, Uncle Ben, I think, has been shot by the very same thief that he chose not to stop in a robbery earlier in the movie. And we actually hear Peter Parker say something to the effect of it, kind of, if only I had stopped him when I had the opportunity to, or if only I'd stopped him when I could have. And what we're observing here is the, the kind of thought experiments that Peter Parker is going through, which is imagining the counterfactual. So the counterfactual can be our mind's way of envisioning how our current situation might have been different if only we had done something different, if we'd acted or not acted in a different way. Uh, I think the perfect counterfactual would be traveling back in time and altering our actions. So if I could go back to this morning and, and not go for that run or have two coffees, and then because I am the same person with all the same characteristics, it would be safe to assume that any difference in my day is due to the, the difference in my morning routine. Sadly, we can't travel back in time. Um, so we find other ways to estimate our counterfactuals. And this is through observing control groups and comparative groups. So as I've mentioned, RCTs allow us to create a counterfactual by randomization. And when we're talking about quasi-experimental designs, we're just trying to come up with an alternative way to think about a control or a comparative group. Um, if we implement and also interpret QEDs properly, which is obviously a big assumption, um, then they, they should allow us to kind of estimate causality or causal inference with kind of no need for a, a randomized group um, 
we can take advantage of naturally occurring control or comparator groups. We can also take advantage of what we might think of as natural designs or natural experiments. So it takes less um, kind of designing in a, in a lab environment. Um, and the really good thing is that QEDs over the course of COVID, I guess, have shown themselves to be very adaptable to new ways of, of working online, which is becoming increasingly important within the, the education space. So to pause for a moment and give you a break from the sound of my voice, um, I am curious to know what you think these three things have in common. So if we were in a room together, this would be an easier exercise, but if anyone has an idea for what these three things have in common, please do drop that in the chat box. So you're looking at cheese and ramen on the left, sultanas and scones in the middle, and pizza and pineapple on the right. Does anyone have an idea? So someone is suggesting that they're all food. They are, but that's not the answer we were looking for. They're all yellowish. Coincidentally, they are. It also wasn't quite the answer we were looking for. Someone suggesting that they're controversial ingredients. And this is getting a little bit closer. Someone saying they're ingredients which should not be allowed to mix. And I think this is pretty much what we're trying to get at, which is that, in my opinion, these are all terrible matches, very poor matches. Pizza on pineapple is not a good match. Sultanas or fruit generally should never exist in something that's trying to be cake. So these are all awful matches. Which brings us on to propensity score matching. So what are the methodologies or the tools that we can use to create better matching? I'm going to situate this example in a, an evaluation that we're trying to set up and run at Tezo at the moment. So let's consider the example of a multi-intervention outreach and mentoring project. So we call that MIOM for short. Um, so a MIOM program is a kind of suite of widening participation activities that are delivered over the course of kind of nine to 12 months to help disadvantaged or underrepresented students get into higher education. Now, let's imagine that this program was opt-in. So there's no random assignment to the program. The student applies and they are provided with a place in the program provided they meet a bunch of kind of selection criteria. So how could we evaluate this program to allow us to estimate causality in the context of it being an opt-in program? What we can do is create a matched comparative or a control group. So we have a data set full of people, um, full of students, and we have the characteristics of those students that are part of the program. So these are the students that have opted in and that we're therefore thinking of as our, our treatment group. So as you can see, we've got information about age, gender, their polar quintile, which is just a postcode measure, whether or not they've got experience of children's social care. And then on the very far right column here, we've got the outcome measure. So did they enter higher education at the end of the program? And they, this is binary. They either, they either did or they did not enter higher education. Um, and we have a scenario where we've got a general population on the left hand side and a proportion of that population have decided to take part in the Mayan program. So they applied and they joined. We can't compare the Mayan program to applicants in the general population, so to everyone else in the world, um, for the obvious reason that there's something unique about their circumstances that led them to seek out and apply for the program. So the so-called unobservable variables. So who knows what this could be? Um, it could be motivation. They might have a friend who recommended it. They might have an older sibling or a cousin who joined the program. We, we just don't know. Um, we could expand our data set to, to gather more information on this, but it's, it's unrealistic that we're going to be able to hold all the data that might influence their decision. So what we do is we generate a control group that gives us a meaningful comparison to estimate causality. So we use matching to create this control group and people who are in the treatment group, so the, the green people, the green dots, are lined up to a matched or equivalent comparable person in the control group, so the little red dots. 
Now, randomization does this naturally. It gives us a treatment and a control group that are on average comparable. With matching, we're trying to engineer that control. So if we have someone who is in the treatment group, we're trying to find an equivalent person or the nearest neighbor, we call it, to them in the control group. How do we do that? The first thing we do is, so I've just mentioned that we find the nearest neighbor, we identify characteristics of people in the treatment and line them up with the equivalent person in the control. So we have a student on the left who is 16, male, from a Polar 4 Quintile 1 background and does not have experience of children's social care. What we do is we find this person's nearest match in the control, so in the, in the general population. So we find someone with the, on paper, the same characteristics. It's worth noting in case it's not super obvious that these are different students. So we're not matching them um, to themselves in another data set. We're matching them to completely different people who share similar characteristics. However, there is still a concern with this process. Um, so there is still something that makes it quite challenging to draw causal inference from this matching method. And this is the unobservable differences between the treatment and the control group. So an obvious one that we often think about in education is motivation. Um, it's something that's quite hard to, to observe, it's quite hard to tie down, and it's definitely difficult to kind of capture in a robust way across data sets. Um, so with this method, we only have the variables available to us and we're limited by what we're able to observe. And nearest neighbor matching is a solution to the matching problem um, that in the, it, it kind of involves giving us the closest, the next closest data point, but it doesn't solve the challenge of unobservables. As I mentioned, I think we could add more and more variables. We could make this data set bigger and bigger and bigger. And while that would probably improve the accuracy of our matching, it's unlikely that we're ever going to be able to account for all the variance that unobservable variables introduce. So another tool in our kind of matching toolkit is the idea of a propensity score. So propensity score matching, or we call it PSM for short, is similar, but it is slightly different to nearest neighbor matching. So instead of just looking at the, the next closest person matched on, on basic observable characteristics, a propensity score takes the characteristics that we know about someone. So thinking back to our, our previous slide, things like age, gender, whether or not the individual has experience of social care and uses this information to generate or predict a propensity score. So given that the characteristics we know, the what we would call these as explanatory variables, so variables that hold explanatory power, the propensity score tells us their likelihood to enter higher education, having participated in our multi-intervention outreach and mentoring program. So it's really this kind of likelihood to score is, is how I think of it. And it's a score between zero and one. So you can see on the bottom X axis here. Um, and it's a consolidation of all the other factors that we know about someone. So it's a more meta data point and it's a more, more precise than nearest neighbor. A matched set consists of at least one participant from the treatment and one participant from the control that have a similar propensity score. So you can see that in our, our little red dot and our little green dot um, in both the treatment and control here. So what we need to do for PSM is have a strong data set with explanatory variables. So all the characteristics about the students that we're interested in, and we need to have the outcome data for this element. So the, the right-hand column on whether or not students entered higher education. Um, and this is because we're trying to predict that outcome. So to, this is probably oversimplifying it and I can definitely provide further reading afterwards, but for people who are kind of practically minded, I'm gonna quickly run through these, these five steps on the left-hand side and what we would need to do to be able to conduct propensity score matching. So the, the first thing is to prepare the data. So we need a data set for both the treatment group that we are interested in. So that's our students who took part in the Myon program and a, a comparative control group 
We then use our explanatory variables, so the characteristics that we know about the students, to estimate the propensity score. Then we want to match the participants based on those propensity scores. So as, as outlined in the, in the slide previously, uh, we want to line people up with an equivalent person who has a similar propensity score. And then we evaluate the covariance. So what we're talking about here is kind of balance checks. So looking at the demographics and the characteristics of people in the treatment and the control and making sure that they're balanced at baseline. So we also do this in, in randomized experiments, um, but it's particularly important when we've engineered the control group like this, and it's not a, a true experimental control group. And then finally, we look to compare the two groups, which again, we would do with a randomized experiment. Something that's important to note here is that the propensity score is generated after the intervention. So after the Myon program has taken place, once we know the outcomes, so the entry to higher education. Um, where previously we were talking about nearest neighbor matching, this can be done without the outcome data. So before the intervention, but for propensity score matching, we do it post intervention, which is why it can be quite a nice um, quasi experimental methodology to use when we've already got program data or evaluation data. It's not necessarily something that has to be embedded up front prior to the program taking place in the way that, for instance, a uh, a randomized experiment would. Um, I also want to just flag when we cannot use propensity score matching. So it's not possible to use PSM when we don't have something called common support. So quite simply common support is when we have an overlap between the propensity scores of both groups, so the treatment and the control group. We've got two scenarios that I'm trying to demonstrate this with here. On the, on the left-hand side, we've got a tight overlap. So it's easy to identify the little green dot or the little green person in the treatment group and match them to the little red dot in the control group. And the overlap in the propensity score, the kind of closeness of this of the two trends um, gives us the opportunity to match. On the right-hand side, we've got the inverse really. So we don't have any common support, we don't have much overlap, and um, it makes it difficult to use propensity score matching. Um, it's, worth, it's kind of worth noting that it's, it's rarely this binary, if ever, this binary. I think usually we have some overlap. Um, there's often like a little group in the middle that overlap, and then we've got tails at either end with, with outliers and people who, who don't overlap. Um, so again, probably making it look oversimplified here. Um, but essentially what we're trying to get at is that observations with the same propensity score have the same distribution of observable characteristics, which is independent of the treatment. And that's what we're trying to understand is based on those observable characteristics, can we create common support? So one thing to note is that although we can use propensity score matching to design evaluations um, in and of themselves, and it, it's a really helpful way to push us into a more kind of empirical inquiry. We also can add propensity score matching to other methodologies. So you'll often see propensity score matching used alongside a difference in difference to match the treatment and the control group there. So it's one of those tools that can be built upon um, and has kind of cumulative power when trying to design impact evaluations that allow us to estimate causality. So I am going to hand you over to my colleague Zara now. Um, so she's going to talk you through the difference in difference method, which is just another, another tool in our, our QED box. Over to you, Zara. Thank you, Rain. Uh, so as you said, we're now going to talk about the difference in difference methodology. Uh, it's another example of quasi-experimental design that allows us to expose, explore causality and ask causal questions as part of an impact evaluation. So before I explain to you what difference in different means, uh, I'm going to ask you um, a short question. Uh, wait, if you can change the slide. Thank you. Um, so what do each of these things have in common? So first of all, in the first picture, you have an old Nokia and an iPhone, then you have a Coke and a Pepsi, and then you have three different Spider-Man. What do you think is the common? between all of them? 
Uh, so, yeah, exactly. I think most people understand what we're talking about, which means that they are both similar, but actually different. And that's what we're going to look like when we look at difference in difference, meaning that we compare the change in an outcome over time between a population that has been enrolled in a program, which is a treatment group, and a population that is not. So we compare over time and we compare two different populations. And we combine the before and after and uh, the trend between treatment and control group. So we're going to explore this further using an example of a project that BASO has been working on uh, to evaluate an initiative aimed at reducing the attainment gap between BME students and white students. Um, so the initiative is a response to a call for a more diverse curricula. The provider that we're working with has been uh, auditing a number of core cool undergraduate modules and explored a way to incorporate BME's authors and perspective into the modules. Um, so the study is a match different in difference, which means that we compare students' attainment trends between the modules that have uh, implemented the reform curricula, so the treatment modules, and those who have not. And um, we need to make sure that the treatment and the comparative modules were matched on a bunch of criteria, such as the campus that they were taught on, um, whether the module was textbook driven, because only non-textbook driven modules have enough scope for curricular diversification. Uh, we also look at the average number of students enrolled, the average percentage of BAME students, and the attainment of the students. So let me now talk through how we use the difference in different in this context. Uh, so when you look at the graph, just um, be aware that the x axis uh, corresponds to time and the y axis corresponds to the outcome that we're trying to measure. Um, so firstly, imagine if we only study the modules that go through the circular curriculum process, uh, sorry, circular reform process. So for these modules, we would have before and after data on students' attainment for these modules. But here, there is a challenge uh, because we don't have a comparison group. And so there might be other things happening in the student's life that will impact attainment after the model has been through the curriculum reform exercise. So it means that we're not sure whether it's actually this um, curriculum reform that has had an impact on students' attainment or if it's uh, another factor. So we could be misattributing the change in attainment um, to the curriculum change, whereas it would be linked to something else. Uh, similarly, if we, could, if we were to only look at outcome data, which means like the post-changing in the modules for both the treated module and the not treated module, then we don't have a comparison for before the intervention and we cannot really understand how um, the intervention had an impact on, um, on the outcome. So what we get to if we mix those two approaches is the difference in difference model. So it's two comparison. It's a comparison before and after the, the intervention and also between two groups. So in our example, we are observing reform modules, which correspond to the green line before and after. And we also comparing it with the modules who have not been reformed, which corresponds to the red line. Um, so if we are trying, uh, what we are trying to do is observe those, um, those green, I mean, this green line and understand how the, the interventions had driven this change. So if, because we see that um, before the, the change has been implemented, the two lines were parallel, which means that uh, the two groups of modules, the ones in the treatment group and the ones in the control group were following a similar trend of going upward, uh, but they were also parallel. So it means that we're going to be able to, we're going to be able to uh, measure up, oh, sorry, measure the difference by looking at the difference in difference. To break this down a little, um, we're able to observe the constant difference in the outcome by looking at the red line, and then we estimate the intervention effect by looking at the change in the green line. So it's good practice to have multiple comparison groups 
uh, which means control, that are similar for different reasons. Now we're going to try and look at a quick exercise together to make sure that we really understand what's going on. Obviously, if we're in a room together, it would be easier, but I'm going to try and run the math twice. And if you, if you get lost, feel free, please feel free to email us afterward, or you can also watch the recording and then you can pause whenever you need to. So first of all, we're going to look at what's happening before the intervention. We see that we have two groups, the control group and the treatment group, and they have uh, different outcomes. So the control group has an outcome measure of three, and the treatment group has an outcome measure of five. So if you <laughs> five minus three equals two, so you can see that the gap between those two groups to begin with is two. Now we're going to move on. Um, to after the intervention. So time goes by, the intervention happens, and we see that um, the control group has now, now has an attainment of six, and the treatment group has now an attainment of 12. So it means that over time, uh, the general outcome has increased for both groups, but it hasn't increased in a parallel trend, right? Because if it was following a parallel trend, then we would get um, a gap of two, which corresponds to the gap that existed before the intervention. And now we have a gap that's greater than two. So to calculate the gap, we observe that we have, um, we now have um, outcome measure of 12 for the treatment group and an outcome measure of six for the control group. So 12 minus six equals six. And we know that to begin with, we had a gap of two. So if it wasn't, we suppose that if it wasn't for the intervention, we would actually have a treatment group um, that will have an outcome measure of eight. So it means that overall, we suppose that the intervention had an effect of four. Oh, sorry, you're not following. I'm going to go over it uh, again, and hopefully that will, that will help. Uh, do let me know if you are following. <laughs> that could also be helpful. So basically what we're trying to measure is what, we, uh, what I was talking about before, which is the, the intervention effect. And it is four. And how do we measure it? Basically, we start looking at the gap before the intervention. So before the intervention, we have a control group that has an attainment of three and a treatment group that has an attainment of five. So we see that this corresponds to a gap of two. So remember that the gap between the, between the two groups before the intervention was two. And you see that it's parallel trend, so it's always two before the intervention. And if then we move to after the intervention, we're going to look at the, at the numbers and we see that the control group now has um, an outcome of six and the treatment group has an attainment of 12, okay? So what we're going to try and what we're going to do is think, but what if the intervention hadn't happened? Because uh, before the intervention, the gap between the two models was always, uh, between the two groups of models was always two. We assume that it would still be two even like after the intervention if the intervention didn't have any effect, okay? So if that was the case, we would have an outcome of six uh, for the control group, which is what we have, but we would have an outcome of eight for the treatment group, right? Because uh, six plus two equals eight. Um, but actually we have an outcome of 12. So we're trying to understand why is the case. And we suppose that because um, we're doing difference in difference, right? So. Sorry, I'm, I'm just seeing, <laughs> seeing things in the chat and trying to uh, keep my reasoning straight. But um, yeah, basically we see that now the gap has moved on from being two to being six. And we know that there was already a gap of two. So six minus two equals four and four then corresponds to the intervention effect. I hope it's I hope it's clear and hopefully if you listen to it again, then it will be 
it will be easier to understand. Um, so yeah, that's how we measure the, the intervention effect. And uh, what we're trying to do effectively is measure the, is um, mimicking a regression model. So for each individual line of data, it, it's as if we had a regression model um, where we have an unobserved counterfactual. So you see in this case, the counterfactual is the dotted green line. It's what if the intervention hadn't happened for the treatment group? So we suspect that because the two groups were following parallel trends before the intervention, they would continue to follow a parallel trend, which is why we had this line. But actually, the treatment did happen, and we ended up with this uh, green line. So that's, that's the idea that we're trying to um, understand. And it corresponds to a regression where the main effect is time. Uh, sorry with a main effect of time, a main effect of the intervention. And there is also an in interaction element between time and intervention. Uh, it's important to understand uh, key, some key assumptions um, on the difference for different model. Uh, the first important assumption is that uh, we estimate parallel trends. So I talked about that before. It means that before we have the intervention, the slope of the treatment and the slope of the control group should be similar because otherwise we can't assume that they're going to be similar after treatment for um, the counterfactual. Uh, yeah, ideally we would want to the pre-intervention points to be as close as possible and we would like to have almost overlapping lines, but it's not necessary. We can, I mean, in this case, we don't. What's really important is the parallel trends. And obviously we want to have um, clever ways, we want to find clever ways to get comparable groups between um, control and um, control and treatment. The second assumption is that there are no spillover effects, which means that the treatment group and the control group need to be independent. Uh, so for example, in the case that we've been looking at so far, if there is a um, course convener that of one of the reform models that suggested to his colleagues that they should also start implementing similar changes, for example, like a different reading list, then there would be a spillover effect because the treatment group will start to impact the control group. And in this case, we cannot do the difference in difference. Another example of spillover could be that uh, if we're going to introduce a safe driving campaign, for example, to two classrooms of students, and if one group of students tell their friends on the other classroom that didn't have the, that didn't have the campaign about uh, the material or the videos of the lesson they have learned in the course, then we're having spillover effects because the treatment, uh, the control group is going to be affected by the treatment once again. Uh, so now we're going to move on to the final example of a quasi-experimental design. It's called regression continuity design and like propensity score matching and difference in difference, the regression to discontinuity design allows us to estimate causal effects without using randomization. Um, so the idea here is to um, engineer a control group. So I'm going to um, present an example. We're going to think about a scholarship program uh, where we want to, want to understand the extent to which giving students money to go to HE in form of a scholarship can improve their grades once they are in HE. So obviously it's a tough question to answer because the students who win the scholarship may be different in many ways from the students who do not win the scholarship. So it's going to be hard to know whether the differences in grades um, are due to the differences in between individual or if they are due to the, the impact of the scholarship. But obviously, if we are going to fund the scholarship, we want to know if it's actually going to have a causal effect on it, the causal impact on attainment. So let's say here that our scholarship is awarded based on the score is scoring. Um, so people who get above a certain threshold in a test or an exam, uh, for example, 70%, are uh, being given the scholarships and all those who didn't attain this threshold, so they got 69 or under, 
um, are not given the scholarship. The key to estimate the effect of the scholarship here is to use the threshold. Uh, because if you think about it, there's not a huge difference. Um, I'm sure you've all been students and you know that sometimes you really want that 70% and you can have it and you end up with 69. Doesn't mean that you've studied in a completely different way. It doesn't, obviously. It's just a question of one point, which like out of 100 um, doesn't represent a big change. So that's why we can assume that the students who um, scored just under the threshold had like similar study habits, motivation, and previous attainment as the students who scored just uh, above the threshold. Because yeah, at one point, it's just due to like randomness and luck, whether you get the threshold or not. So that's why we can uh, think that all the unobservable variables are similar between the students beyond the threshold and above the threshold. And that's why we're going to use a regression discontinuity design to compare these students. And we're going to consider that the difference in attainment between these two groups of students is the outcome effect. So here, I want you to be um, really aware that we are not looking at the same graph as we were looking at before, the difference in different one. We're looking to, um, on, the X, on the X axis, we're looking at grades on scholarship exam. So the, the exam that's going to determine whether or not you get the scholarship. And on the y-axis, you're going to look at eight-year attainment once you enter the higher education and you got or didn't get the scholarship. So basically all the points on this graph are like um, attainment of students. Obviously we are going to imagine that, I mean, it's safe to assume that uh, grades on scholarship exam and H attainment are linked, and that the more the the be, the, oh, the better grade you got at the scholarship exam, the better your H attainment is going to be. And here we can see um, the dotted the dotted gray line correspond to the threshold. So before the threshold, we have all the students from the control group, those who didn't get the the scholarship and above you get the treatment group the ones who got the scholarship and at the threshold you can see that there's a discontinuity and this discontinuity we're going to assume is due to the to the impact of the scholarship because what else would impact the student's attainment between a student who got 69% uh, on the entrance exam uh, on the scholarship exam and those who got 70% on the, on the scholarship exam, other than uh, the fact that some got the scholarship and the others didn't. So that's why, that's why we're going to use the discontinuity design. And um, the size of the jump is the estimate of the effect of the scholarship. So in other words, uh, if there's a treatment effect of the scholarship on grades attainment, there will be a discontinuity in the regression line at the scholarship cutoff threshold. I'm just going to let you look at the graph for a second because I know it's going really fast. Um, okay, so for this design to work, we need to it needs to follow um, a number of requirements that I'm going to talk you through. So we can look at the first two requirements together. The first one is that the index needs to be smooth. It means that the scoring system that we are using needs to be continuous and granular. So in this case, uh, I already started to explain that earlier, but having a test score that goes from zero to 100 works really well because the increase, um, the increase is like really small every time. So it's one point at a time. And that's why we can assume that someone who gets a 70% on the, on the scholarship exam is, I mean, it's only one point away from someone who gets a 69. So it's not a huge gap. And we can't assume that it's linked to um, specific, specific um, characteristics such as uh, level of motivation or study habits. 
Whereas if we're using a scoring system such as A, B, C, then there's a bigger gap, a larger gap between A and B, for example. And it's more difficult to assume that someone who got an A is a similar in on the unobservable factor that impact HCI attainment as someone who got a B. Um, and linked to the above, we also need to have a very defined cutoff. So here we talked about the cutoff at 70%. Maybe you think it's unfair, but that's actually that's useful when you're doing the research because um, that's how you know that these people are like not that different from the others, but still they got some got the scholarship and some didn't. Whereas if you had a larger, like mo uh, less well-defined cutoff point, then it would be harder to do the regression discontinuity design. Uh, the third requirement is that the cutoff must be unique to this program and this population. It means that um, because we're using the cutoff and the threshold as an approximation for randomization, uh, it's important that I mean, you are, as I said before, if you score above 70%, you're in the treatment group, and if you score below, you in the control group, so you receive the scholarship or you don't. But if, uh, for example, those who score 70% or above also receive a special program for high achieving students, um, in addition to the scholarship, then we cannot say anymore that um, the difference between those who scored 69 and those who scored 70 um, comes only to, I mean, only corresponds to a difference in getting the scholarship or not getting the scholarship. So that's why we focusing, I mean, if we want to make sure that the regression discontinuity design is actually um, working, we need to make sure that the cutoff only applies to the specific program that we are trying to evaluate and not to a wider suite of support. And the final requirement is also that uh, the score of students obviously cannot be manipulated by anyone. So if um, it happens that the student can negotiate with the teacher for getting a 70% when they had the 69 or, or below, then you're not going to be able to um, suppose that the students who got the scholarships are similar to those who didn't because you're going to think, well, the students who got the scholarship were actually the ones that were better at arguing with the teacher and getting what they want. So that's why it's important that the scores of the students haven't been manipulated if you want to observe a real treatment effect. Um, 